Hello, welcome back to Historical Geology. We're gonna keep walking through module five here on the Cenozoic, the current geologic era. We talked last time about the tertiary quaternary and we talked about Cenozoic life, everything except for primates and humans. And today we're gonna go back and fill in that gap. Next week, we're gonna kind of finish up with talking about where we go from here. Before we do that, some announcements. Uh, not really though, because this is a re-record. So welcome to Examine Earth. I won't be posting many more of these full length lectures because I'm gonna try to focus on the 10 minute mini lectures, but there were some gaps in what was offered. So I'm gonna kind of go back. Uh, I can't post all of my lectures because there's student privacy information, uh, publisher copyright, et cetera, but I really wanted to go back and post this one. So uh, I removed a lot of that stuff. So hopefully you find this lecture informative. And with that said, you know, let's just get into it. So here's some review questions from the previous lecture, which I don't think we actually have, but which advantage allowed mammals to flourish during the Cenozoic? Uh, <laughs> take a look there. So the fact that mammals were warm blooded was a huge advantage in the Cenozoic. The Cenozoic starts out in the Paleocene and Eocene as pretty, pretty warm, uh, much hotter than it is today. But then that trend of getting cooler and drier and the quote unquote ice age at the very end, being warm blooded allowed mammals to really move into the high latitudes that reptiles and cold blooded animals just can't. Uh, think about all the mammals that live at those high latitudes and how they thrive. That was our main advantage. We thrive in a cool world. And unfortunately that is not the trend that we see in the modern day. Uh, the next one is what example of, which is an example of geology or tectonics impacting biology? So look at those there, which of those is, is, is an example of geology and tectonics impacting biology? Again, one of the points of this class is to see how the lithosphere, the biosphere, the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, the cryosphere, all of these are linked and interacting with each other. The answer here is, uh, the evolution of bats and whales is the only one that is not an obvious example. Uh, however, even that one wouldn't have happened without the KPG uh, extinction event with the, the asteroid impact uh, that killed off the dinosaurs. But the Bering Land Bridge allowed animals to move from Asia to North America in both the Mesozoic and in the Cenozoic, which we'll talk a little bit about today. And the Panama Connection, the Isthmus of Panama, connects North America and South America in the Cenozoic and allows for the great American biotic exchange, which we talked about last time. And then the isolation of Australia. Australia has been tectonically isolated, floating as its own little land mass ever since it broke off from Gondwana. And that allowed the Australian animals to stay very, well, uh, let's say Australian, uh, this very unique fauna of Australia due to geologic isolation, tectonic isolation. All right, great. So let's get into lecture for today. So the end Cretaceous mass extinction, just like we saw with previous mass extinctions, the, the uh, sort of ruling animals that were filling a lot of these major niches, the large bodied forms are primarily gone. Uh, at the end of this extinction event, the largest thing on earth is probably no larger than a big dog all of the non-avian dinosaurs are gone. All of the large marine reptiles are gone. All of the pterosaurs are gone. And so these niches on the land, in the sea and in the sky are open. And in the Cenozoic, it's primarily the mammals that rapidly diversify into these niches. So you see here, here's a time scale. These are millions of years. This is the Mesozoic, the quote unquote age of reptiles that comes to a sudden and abrupt end with the asteroid impact and the other factors that we discuss. Uh, mammals are not very diverse in the Mesozoic. Uh, there are probably all these kind of quote unquote ghost lineages that probably do exist back in the Mesozoic. We just don't have a good fossil record for it. Uh, primarily because when we get on the other side of that impact, there's this very, very rapid diversification of mammals. And again, that's what we saw before with these prior extinction events. There's extinction, biodiversity drops, lots of things go extinct, but then life uh, finds a way 
and the survivors repopulate the earth very quickly. We go from this big suffering and drawback to a very rapid diversification. And we see this basically every single time, and this is no exception. Basically all of the animal, the mammal groups that you can think of, uh, they emerge very soon after this event. In the seas, the marine fauna recovers. Uh, in particular, scleractinian corals, modern corals sort of take over from the rudest bivalve reefs of the Mesozoic. So again, this uh, particular animal that was dominating an ecosystem, dominating a niche is extinct and a different animal arises and fills that role and thrives. We see this with flowering plants and particularly grasses as well. Grasses probably extend into the Mesozoic. There's some evidence in dinosaur, uh, let's say, leavings that grasses existed back in the Mesozoic. Don't have any grass fossils, but in the Cenozoic, grasses very rapidly expand, especially as the climate gets cooler and drier, which is where grasses really kind of thrive, where other plants kind of don't. Uh, and so this is Purgatorius. This is a mammal and it's a particular kind of mammal. It's one of the earliest primate ancestors. Uh, it's named Purgatorius because it's from the Hell Creek Formation, Hell Purgatory. Uh, it was originally thought that it's kind of spanned across the extinction event. So it was from the Mesozoic, the very, very, very late Mesozoic, uh, and then actually survived through the extinction event into the Cenozoic. Uh, but it, after some redating, it emerges probably very quickly in the Cenozoic. So again, life, fairly rapidly rebounds. It's like hundreds of thousands of years, but in geologic time, that's pretty rapid. And again, we see this explosion of diversity in the mammals fairly soon after this extinction event. And primates are one of these groups. Uh, so the whole point today is to talk about primate evolution and eventually hominin evolution. And primates, <laughs> primate means first rank. So we are the ones that named, uh, you know, all of this, these taxonomic categories, and we think fairly highly of ourselves. So first rank primates, we are first, first rank. Primates probably arose in the very earliest Paleocene, although they may have originated in the latest Mesozoic. So they might have made it through the mass extinction, or again, might have been one of the first groups that emerges on kind of the other side of that extinction event. And the early forms are adapted to living in the trees. They have an arboreal lifestyle and probably primarily nocturnal. And we see that with still some of the more primitive, uh, and again, primitive, not a pejorative, just uh, more basal on the evolutionary tree. Uh, they have these grasping hands. There is this transition from claws, like we see in like cats, for example, to nails where the nail is on the top of the finger and we actually have fingertips for sort of manipulating things. Uh, and then the forward facing eyes is another characteristic of primates. And primates are primarily found in the tropics. And so as the continents moved towards the north and as the climate cooled, they were sort of concentrated uh, in the tropics and sort of this more narrow and narrow and narrower band. And now primates are only found in the tropics today with one notable exception, us. So humans have adapted to essentially every climate on earth. There are humans on Antarctica right now. Now, obviously they're in their camp. Uh, there's actually humans up in space on the ISS right now. So humans are very, very versatile. We managed to move out of the tropics, uh, but that's not true for the rest of the primates. Uh, so let's take a look at this group in general and the, the whole like classification scheme, again, this is a cladogram of primate evolution. Here is the primates as a, as a whole. Uh, and we can see sort of the, the more basal members working up to the more derived members with humans uh, at the quote unquote top of the cladogram. Remember that being at the top of the cladogram, uh, it doesn't mean we're better or best. Uh, it just means that we're the most derived and the latest form to evolve. Humans are quite good at being humans, but if we tried to do what a gibbon does, we would fail. Gibbons are very good at gibbon things. And so gibbons are no less advanced or uh, you know, better <laughs> than us. 
Uh, it's just that we happen to occupy this uh, very crown word position on the cladogram. And this is something that we sort of recognize with other animals, but it's been historically difficult for us with ourselves. We've complicated matters of classifying primates by basically constantly having this baggage of trying to put ourselves uh, at the top of the tree, trying to give ourselves priority, trying to separate ourselves from the rest of uh, all of these apes and monkeys. So primate evolution, primate classification historically has been uh, fairly difficult. So let's kind of start at the bottom of this cladogram and we'll work our way up through these different groups. So we're going to start at the most basal, uh, most stem word clad here, the prosimians. So prosimians are these very large eyes. And again, why would you need large eyes? So evolutionarily, the larger your eye is, the more light it's going to co collect. And so large eyes are good for low light environments. So here are the eyes of like a tarsier, these very, very large eyes for operating at night. And that's primarily what mammals were doing in the Mesozoic is operating at night. It's one of the reasons why birds that evolved from dinosaurs, the kind of apex animals in the Mesozoic, they have very, very good color recognition. Think about how colorful birds are and how they use color to communicate. They can even see in the ultraviolet spectrum to communicate with each other. Uh, humans don't have that degree and primates don't have that degree of color recognition because we evolved from nocturnal ancestors and the prosimians are sort of a callback to this legacy. Uh, we are better than a lot of other animals that see in color, but not as good as birds. These prosimians are generally pretty small and again, mostly living in trees, the arboreal lifestyle, and we just see some of these forms here. Uh, moving along the cladogram, uh, we have the old world monkeys. So these are monkeys, and you still see that most of them uh, still have the tail, but uh, they're not prehensile tails, so they can't actually, you know, hook things with their tails, uh, but they do have the grasping hands, they have the downward facing nostrils, so this is something that's not very common in other animals, but it is in us. And they evolved probably in the Oligocene, so Paleocene, Eocene, Oligocene, uh, a little bit farther along in the Cenozoic than the Prosimians. And there's things like macaques, uh, baboons, uh, sp specifically this very specific kind of baboon, the mandrill, uh, very famous for its very colorful face and other parts. And then this kind of goofy looking proboscis monkey, uh, the quote unquote nose monkey, <laughs> not a very flattering name, but uh, very fitting, I suppose, if you look at their very prominent feature here. So these are the old world monkeys uh, in Africa and Southeast Asia. And somehow we got the new world monkeys. Uh, so new world monkeys are in South America and Central America, again, confined to the tropics with this very famous prehensile tail here. Uh, if you ever go to the zoo and watch the monkeys in the monkey house, they're very agile, uh, very efficient at moving around in the trees, their arboreal lifestyle, both the hands and feet, the quadra manus, four hands essentially, their feet are essentially hands, uh, and their tail is really almost like a fifth hand. They're able to manipulate things with it quite well. They have this flattish face, which, is, which we kind of share with that, and widely separated nostrils, which is not common in other animals. Uh, kind of oddly though, these new world monkeys originated from monkeys in Africa, but they don't appear until the Oligocene about 40 million years ago. And by this time, South America and Africa, where the other monkeys originate, have been split tectonically for tens of millions of years. So how did they get across from Africa to South America? It's still kind of an outstanding question here, and I'll cover that in just a second. But uh, this includes things like the howler monkeys with their famous howling, uh, very, very noisy monkeys, and spider monkeys, and these cute little squirrel monkeys, which are very neat to watch in the zoo. Uh, so how did they actually do that? How did they get across the not as wide as it is now Atlantic Ocean, but still pretty wide ocean? 
uh, in the concept of uh, paleo biogeography, there's this concept of uh, sweepstakes dispersal. So sweepstakes like the lottery. So again, like hitting the lottery is something that's pretty unlikely. And this sort of dispersal, this sort of migration into a new area is also incredibly unlikely. It, again, it happened about 40 million years ago when the continents were already separated. Somehow these monkeys made it their ancestors from Africa to South America and into Central America, but the continents were already separated for at this point, probably about 60 million years. So the sweepstakes dispersal idea is that monkeys might have rafted across to South America. The Atlantic's not as anywhere near as wide as it is today, but it's still a substantial distance there. Uh, and when I say raft, I don't mean like they built a raft like Swiss Family Robinson or whatever. Uh, but if we have like big storms or, or like tsunami waves or something like that, very often like mangrove, coastal mangrove forests are sort of torn off and they can drift. And sometimes there are animals caught in the drifting mangroves or any kind of flotsam and jetsam floating in the sea could host life on that flotsam and jetsam and, and make it to a different place. Now, obviously that would be a very harrowing and unlikely journey probably almost every single time they wouldn't actually make it. But again, we're operating with millions of years of geologic time. Uh, even unlikely events are going to happen eventually, probably <laughs> just like a lottery. Somebody wins the lottery. It's probably not going to be you, but somebody does, as unlikely as that is. Now, this is a little bit controversial because if you're on this raft, Obviously, there's no way to steer it. There's no way to keep it stable. It has to maintain upright. It has to have enough resources for them to survive. Uh, there have to be enough of them on there that they can establish a breeding population once they get there. So there's a lot of things that are kind of weird about this. And it's kind of met with speculation uh, or skepticism, I should say. Uh, but like a recent example of this, the Fukushima tsunami there was a dock that ripped off on Japan, floated all the way across the entire Pacific Ocean and made it to North America, docked in, I think it was Oregon. And it had like a thriving, healthy bivalve community attached to it. So these are sessile, you know, not moving organisms and they migrated all the way across an ocean. So how does something that can't even move migrate across an ocean? Well, this is an example of the sweepstakes dispersal. Uh, so how does it happen with these animals? If we look at who did it, uh, one of the more famous examples is going from Africa to Madagascar, which is, you know, a lesser distance, but there's documentation here of monkeys again getting from mainland Africa to Mad Madagascar, uh, particularly the very famous numerous of Madagascar that spawned that, uh, let's say, great movie. <laughs> Uh, we see in the Paleocene, Temrex, Eocene, lemurs, fossas, the kind of small cats, and then eventually mice in the Miocene somehow make it from mainland Africa to Madagascar, even though Madagascar is already separated from the mainland of Africa. It broke off with India and then eventually separated from India as well. Uh, there were a lot of experiments to see if this would even be possible, and under current conditions, it's not. Uh, under current conditions, the ocean currents do not make something passively drift from Africa to Madagascar. But if we look at this in more detail, the Pliocene, nothing makes it across. And in the Pleistocene, the quote unquote ice age, uh, only hippos make it across. And, you know, hippos are adapted to an aquatic lifestyle, not necessarily seawater. So it's still a very unlikely event. But it looks like once we get into the Miocene, this kind of sweepstakes is, it becomes, it goes from unlikely to probably impossible, and this sort of shuts off. Uh, and we can kind of see that, you know, the sweepstakes becomes unwinnable at this point. But it's interesting to think about how this could possibly ever happen. Uh, so that's kind of primates as a whole. Now we get into the apes, uh, so hominoidea, uh, apes, and humans, we, we are apes. Uh, we, us and all of the other apes are included in this group called hominoidea. I'll talk about what hominoidea versus hominin, talk about that on the next slide, but 
Hominoidea is all of the apes and they're all endangered. So in the current world, all of these apes that are closest to us evolutionarily, all of them are endangered. Uh, again, probably due to climate change and land use changes, and in some cases even hunting. Uh, but these diverge from the old world monkeys that we just talked about uh, from that originated in Africa. And we have today surviving are the lesser apes, which are gibbons, and siamangs, which are basically these like larger, darker colored gibbons. They've got these uh, big you know, throat pouches for making very loud, impressive gibbon noises. Uh, there's the great apes that include the orangutans, <clears throat> uh, gorillas, and chimpanzees, although sometimes chimpanzees are lumped in with hominins, which includes modern humans and uh, all of our extinct uh, human ancestors. Uh, the split between us and chimpanzees happened like six or seven-ish million years ago. And again, we didn't evolve from chimpanzees. That question, like, if we evolved from chimpanzees, why are chimpanzees still here? Well, we didn't evolve from chimpanzees. We shared a common ancestor with chimpanzees back uh, six to seven-ish million years ago, and we've been sort of evolving separately ever since. Uh, and again, chimpanzees are very good at chimpanzee things. Humans are very good at human things. Uh, but these are kind of the hominoidea, which includes all of the apes, lesser and great, and, and humans and our extinct ancestors. So uh, let's kind of review cladistics a little bit. So hominoid versus hominid versus hominin, this is a result of cladistics classification. So we talked earlier in the class about Linnaean classification, Linnaean taxonomy that's uh, kind of fallen out of favor. It's a rank-based classification scheme and it doesn't really tell you a lot about phylogeny, the evolutionary history of these animals. And so we've been moving more and more towards cladistics, which is tree-based and shows you the evolutionary relationship. So we just talked about new world monkeys being kind of the basal uh, stem word forms, old world monkeys branching off from that, gibbons and the lesser apes breaking off from there and then into the great apes and finally the hominoid or hominins, I should say. Uh, you can see kind of this nested category. So the blue triangle are the hominoids. This is a super family, super families and in oidea. So hominoidea includes all of these groups. As we go down to the family level, families get the idae suffix and we call them hominids. So everything in the green triangle here are hominids. If you read older literature, hominid is commonly used just for humans, but now it has sort of this new meaning with the cladistics terminologies. The next is hominine, the subfamily, which are hominines, which is just gorillas, chimps, and us, getting to hominins, which is us and chimpanzees. And then finally, uh, technically hominindans, are humans, uh, just humans and our uh, direct ancestors after the human chimpanzee split. So that's kind of the result of this cladistic specification. These names have significance. Uh, the suffixes have significance. And so we're going to be really kind of talking about hominin evolution from here on in, and actually technically hominin evolution, but I have trouble saying hominin. So, uh, what does it mean to be human? So we saw the cladistics tree there, those kind of narrowing triangles. What are the characteristics that change along the way to go from hominoid to hominin? So we have a few traits that separate us from the other hominid apes. So what separates us from the great apes? What separates us from the lesser apes? And really what separates us from chimpanzees. So the one of the main factors here is uh, bipedalism. So other apes can walk on two legs, but they're not able to do it for very long and they're not very efficient at it. They're mostly adapted for quadrupedal motion and also very agile in the trees. Again, that like arboreal lifestyle, kind of less and less so as we get towards us. 
but we are pretty good at bipedalism, and although we're relatively new at it. And so there are some complications. And as we get older, we start to feel them in our knees and our hips and our back and our feet. We're not perfect for bipedalism yet, uh, but hopefully we're getting better over time. Uh, another trait that makes us human is the bigger brains. So as we move further along in this cladogram, uh, the brain size increases, the brain case increases. Not only does the brain get larger, it also gets more complex. The neocortex, sort of the outer rind of the brain, uh, all of the different lobes associated with like complex thinking, uh, they get more complex. So it's not just the size of the brain, it's also the structure of the brain that changes. And so obviously us humans are really, really smart. And that's the thing that defines us with our big old noggins, uh, some noggins bigger than others. <laughs> uh, we also have extended development with uh, a longer gestational period. So human babies are in the womb for nine-ish months. That's longer than some of these other ancestral forms. And our developmental growth stages are much longer. So humans are born more immature and they take longer to mature. Uh, fortunately, we have the luxury of doing that because we have these you know, social structures that support that development, uh, but it allows us to grow our brains. And uh, again, there's this, this kind of march of progress figure here has done more to spread misinformation about evolution than probably any other figure. It's not this constant gradual march towards humans. It's this branching uh, phylogenetic bushy ancestral tree going from the basal more quote unquote primitive forms to the crown word uh, more derived forms which which would ultimately be us but again uh, we're not better than them we're good at doing human things chimpanzees are still very good at doing chimpanzee things uh, moving along uh, so what is the considered the first hominin, what is the first thing that we recognize as like a human ancestor? So this uh, kind of chimpanzee split happens, uh, it used to be like six million years ago, it's kind of getting pushed back a little bit to probably more like seven million years ago, maybe it'll keep getting pushed back further as we get more fossils, but we have been getting more fossils and rather than kind of clearing the picture up, uh, it's made things incredibly complex. Uh, again, this like march of progress, this boom, 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 steady incremental progress towards culminating in us, that's absolutely not how this works. There's this branching of all these different ancestors. Uh, some branches are actually pruned along the way. And all of these different things, uh, by the time we get to, uh, even within the last 100,000 years, there's still multiple hominins alive on Earth. Uh, we'll talk about how we ended up being the last ones a little bit later, but uh, kind of how do we define where the line is between, you know, being an ape and being a human? Where do we draw that line? It gets pretty complicated here. Uh, and again, it kind of defines, it depends on how we define what it means to be human. So, you know, bipedalism, big brain, uh, our language and other capacities like that, the complex brain. Those are the kind of things we use, but uh, generally it's agreed that uh, Australopithecus uh, afarensis uh, lucy is one of our earliest ancestors uh, because we see this uh, bipedal locomotion. If you look at the feet of these hominoids, uh, it, they feet start out as essentially hands for grasping. So basically the earlier forms have essentially four hands and over time, the feet get kind of less and less hand-like and more and more foot-like as they are more and more adapted to bipedal locomotion. Uh, we see here over here some of the earliest kind of milestones in human evolutionary history. I'll flag some of these a little bit later on in the lecture, but uh, this is Lucy. And again, it's a partial skeleton. The white parts are, uh, you know, reconstruction from other closely related animals. I was fortunate enough to be able to see the actual remains, uh, I guess probably about 10 years ago now or so, they actually came to Houston and I was able to see it. It was uh, kind of, it was very interesting to see just kind of how, how small Lucy was and just could kind of be in the presence of the, that, those very early bones, the, the, the kind of first step along the way. 
towards you know modern humans but again it's not a straight path lots of branches lots of fits and starts and how do we become the ones that are left behind uh, this is a trackway in Laetoli in Tanzania in Africa so it's in the East African Rift system uh, the East African Rift system is the kind of cradle of humanity it's where kind of all of these early hominins are found we originated in Africa. I'll talk a little bit later about how when, when we got out of Africa, but th these trackways represent the earliest definitively bipedal walking on two foot trackways. Uh, it's kind of always been assumed that this was Australopithecus afarensis, so something very much like Lucy walking along here. Uh, you can see uh, it really interestingly, there's two sets of hominin footprints, one large and one small. And so this is a larger individual and a smaller individual. So is it an adult and a juvenile? Or in some of the other apes, there is very pronounced sexual dimorphism. Males are much larger than females in some of the apes and gorillas. And so maybe in our earlier ancestors, we had that as well. So it might be a male and a female, but it's probably an adult and a juvenile. And one thing we see is that even though the feet are very different size, and so the individuals are very different size, you see they're kind of matched up with each other, kind of right straight across. So they're kind of matching stride for stride. And so almost certainly they're kind of walking like right next to each other, trying to match each other's pace, maybe even holding hands. So very cool. Again, an example of these trace fossils, our fossilized behavior, we're able to look at these trace fossils and reconstruct a story we can kind of rewind the clock to see what was going on on that day, 3.7 million years ago with some of our earliest ancestors. Uh, again, almost certainly Australopithecus afarensis, but uh, there's something's going on with the human tree where uh, the type specimen of Australopithecus afarensis is supposedly not Australopithecus afarensis. And so I think it's Paranthropus or something like that. So uh, again, this stuff is always constantly under revision, uh, but this is the earliest definitive bipedal trackway. Uh, we can see we have the bones of Australopithecus afarensis. We have the footprints. We can kind of reconstruct the you know physics, the gait of how it actually walked, and this is a, a bipedal trackway. Uh, so why, why bipedal? So one of the things that defines us as human is our bipedal locomotion, but, but why? Why did we start walking upright? Well, uh, for some reason, we came down from the trees. So most of these earlier forms are highly adapted to life in the trees, this arboreal lifestyle. And over time, we become less and less adapted to that. So why? Well, one possible reason is that the climate is getting cooler and drier. Again, it's very hot and probably humid in the beginning of the Cenozoic, but one of the hallmarks of the Cenozoic is that it gets colder and drier. And eventually, while all this human evolution is happening, we descend into the quote unquote ice ages uh, in the Pleistocene, where most of this is happening in the last like 2.6 million years, uh, and especially the last couple hundred thousand for, for modern humans. So trees are just less common. There's this transition from trees which thrive in those uh, wetter conditions to kind of grasslands, to open savanna, open grasslands. And so if you're in an open grassland, it's very beneficial to be able to kind of see farther. Walking on your two legs, your head is higher up. You're able to see a lot farther and a lot better around you. It's sort of like almost like being up in the trees because you're up off the ground a little bit farther. Uh, there's some evidence that it's maybe a little cheaper metab metabolically, but uh, probably actually not. Uh, Four-limbed locomotion, two-limbed locomotion is probably pretty similar. Uh, and also it supports our large head. So if you're walking uh, like this, quadrupedally, the head is kind of hanging out out front. And if the head gets larger, you have to use muscle energy to support that. Uh, with us, our head is kind of directly above all of this support system. Uh, again, the support system is still sort of developing, so we still have some lower back problems and knee problems, ankle problems, toe problems. Uh, but again, bipedalism is relatively new evolutionarily to us, So, but we have these specialized adaptations to walk upright. 
It also, again, the, there's this transition of the hands from being foot-like to hand-like, and we are, use them to manipulate objects, and we use tools now. Uh, other apes are capable of using tools, but they're not quite as dexterous as we are. Uh, and another idea here is that it reduces the area that you're exposed to sunlight. So if you're walking on all fours, uh, your entire back is uh, absorbing uh, solar radiation. You're exposed to the sun. Uh, if you're walking upright, really only your like head and neck and shoulders are, again, think about like where you get sunburn if you're outside walking all day. Uh, you don't get sunburn on your lower back usually, uh, unless you're out laying in the sun. Uh, so you get less solar radiation, you're able to stay a little bit cooler. Uh, you're also, your head's also kind of up farther off the ground in the wind where the air is mixing a little bit more, where there's a little bit lower temperature. So uh, again, we originate in the tropics, which are getting kind of colder as we go here, but they're still the tropics, they're still tropical, it's still warm there, so that's another advantage of being bipedal. So that's why bipedal, uh, why the bigger brain? <laughs> so uh, obviously like as the brain gets larger, we're capable of more complex thought and in, you know, in theory, that's a evolutionary advantage. Uh, what we see is that as the brain case enlarges, so this is a chimpanzee skull and here's a modern human skull, homo sapiens. Uh, here's a homo neanderthalensis skull and what you'll notice is that the brain case is actually a little bit bigger. Uh, Neanderthals probably had a larger brain than we did. So uh, in general, there is this trend of increasing brain size over time. Uh, remember, it's not just necessarily size, but also complexity. Uh, we see the brain, uh, particularly the neocortex, the outside rind of the brain, uh, not only getting bigger, uh, but also kind of more wrinkled, more structured, uh, more complex. But uh, modern human brain size skull size really is limited by the birth canal opening. And so again, this is one of the reasons why we have this extended developmental period. Our skulls can start to start out pretty small and then there's room for them to actually grow. That's why babies have the, you know, quote unquote soft spot. Uh, and then the brain's able to actually expand, the skull expands after we're born. Uh, so we have this extended juvenile development, but as the brain case gets bigger, there are other changes in the skull you see that the kind of brow ridge that's characteristic of these earlier ancestors is diminished. The teeth are diminished. Uh, in modern humans, we don't even have enough room for the third molars, the wisdom teeth. Uh, and very often we have problems with them coming in. That's not a thing that the earlier ancestors would have had. You see this reduction in the incisor, or the, sorry, the canine uh, fang teeth as well. Uh, and we have this kind of odd chin that sort of sticks out. Um, why we have a chin, uh, it's kind of debatable. What's the advantage of having a chin that sticks out? If you've ever been punched in your chin, uh, you know that that's not super advantageous. Uh, it's probably just a passive result of all these other changes in the cranial structure, changes in the skull elsewhere, kind of a result of our kind of flattening face versus kind of this sloping face with the prominent brow. Uh, our skulls not only change size, they, they also change shape and ratios as our brain gets bigger and more complex. And as our brain gets bigger and more complex, uh, we start using tools. Uh, now, originally it was sort of thought that this was a defining trait of humans, so homo habilis, um, human with tools. Uh, but other animals use tools, uh, not just other primates. Other primates use tools uh, very efficiently, but even birds will use tools. And, uh, even like crocodiles will use like a stick or something to try to lure prey in. So they're kind of reasoning and, and using quote unquote tools, uh, obviously not to the degree that we do. It's not like using a wrench or a hammer, but they're using primitive tools, sticks and in some cases stones. And over time, uh, our ancestors developed these different technologies. Uh, it starts out with very kind of simple tools for just kind of hammering, probably to break open bones and get at marrow, which is very nutritious. Uh, and then over time, we sort of learn how to flake off the rocks and not just use them for hammering and crushing, but use them for cutting uh, and maybe even skinning and kind of more delicate operations. Uh, over time, it progresses even to like arrowheads, spearheads, and, and even needles and fish hooks. Uh, so over time, these industries, uh, these cultures get kind of more and more sophisticated. 
Uh, what we can see is that there's actually even evidence of trade, uh, particularly in North America. We can actually see you know, what these tools are made out of. And in some cases, we're able to track back to where those tools came from. And those particular rocks are not necessarily in those areas. Uh, and so not only are we sharing knowledge with each other, so evidence of kind of communication and passing this culture amongst each other, uh, but we're also actually sharing the physical objects and these physical objects are moving around. Uh, so very, very interesting. Uh, one of the kind of defining traits of us being human is kind of this ever more sophisticated tool use and this you know, changing culture. Uh, so uh, you know, some primates kind of pass down these skills as well, but never really to this uh, degree of complexity. Uh, one of our primary tools that we end up using is, is fire. So when we're able to harness fire, again, when we think about fire, it's one of those primal forces of nature, one of the most destructive forces on earth. But we learned how to use it for our advantage. Uh, we weren't necessarily at the whims and mercy of fire, we, we eventually harnessed it. Uh, initially, we probably had to wait for nature to do it for us. So we probably had to wait for a lightning strike or something to start a fire. Uh, thankfully, fires, well, thankfully or not so thankfully, fires are pretty common in grassland savanna areas, which is where our ancestors develop. So we would have had lots of opportunities to kind of just passively capture natural fire. And then at that point, it's you know not exactly rocket science to keep a fire going. Uh, but eventually we would have learned how to actually start fire and use fire. Uh, initially, it probably started out as, you know, just heat. Remember that the climate is cooling and drying into the ice age. And so we probably used it as heat and light. Uh, again, like think about this time where, you know, we don't have flashlights, we don't have street lights. If you leave the safety of the campfire, if you leave the ring of the campfire, you're at the mercy of whatever is out there lurking in the darkness. If you're ever going camping and you leave the campfire, uh, it can be a little scary, a little nerve wracking experience. And then think about how much more nerve wracking it would be when you knew there were other things out there lurking that were trying to put you on the menu, which I guess at least to some degree is still true today, but uh, protection. And then again, with the camping analogy, if somebody starts a campfire, people start gathering around it. Uh, this was a central communal space, uh, probably where language developed, uh, sitting around the campfire, sharing stories, sharing tools, sharing skills, and kind of moving language, uh, moving information between different peoples. Uh, eventually, fire was probably used for cooking. So probably not at first, but eventually fire was used for cooking. Uh, and so once we start using fire for cooking, once there's evidence of fire that's kind of deliberately harnessed and deliberately used for cooking, we very rapidly see the brain size increase. Uh, we're able to eat things that we couldn't before. Think about like trying to eat a potato. It's raw, uh, uh, no thank you. But when you cook a potato, all right, now we're talking. Uh, very starchy, very good foods. Uh, again, like meat, especially like spoiled meat, uh, much better if you're able to cook it first. And so this opens up all these opportunities for new nutrients that we didn't have before. And brains are very metabolically expensive. Uh, brains use a lot of energy. They're about 20% of our mass, but they use about, or sorry, they're 2% of our mass, but they use about 20% of our calories. Brains use up a lot of energy. And now we have access to a lot of energy, a lot of food. It increases our nutrition. Uh, and it also decreases uh, how much we have to chew. And so as our brains are expanding, the jaws kind of have to diminish and it's not as much of a problem anymore if we're able to kind of cook our food. And so in many ways, harnessing this fire really kind of opens up the opportunities here. And so we're fire creatures from an ice age. The development towards modern homo sapien humans is really enabled by fire and it protects us from all these other factors that are happening in the ice age and we still use fire to this day obviously like burning fossil fuels and other things uh, fire is essential to our way of life internal combustion burning things uh, hopefully we're able to move away from 
kind of being fire creatures, but let's go where we are today. Eventually we'd like to become whoop, solar creatures because the sun is an you know, infinite, well, not infinite, but much longer resource and renewable. Uh, so most of this, most of these major milestones, they happen in Africa. Uh, but Homo sapiens, modern humans, uh, probably originate up here. Uh, but by about like 200,000 years, and again, like I'm going to show a lot of dates here. These dates are very highly in flux. Uh, every time we put a date on things, things generally start moving backwards. Our ancestors were much more capable than we ever give them credit for. And every time we try to say that they got here at this time, we always end up finding evidence of something kind of even earlier. Uh, but human, modern humans originate in Africa, and we leave Africa hundreds of thousands of years ago, let's put it that way. But when we do finally leave Africa, uh, we're not the first hominins that left. Uh, so earlier on, uh, much earlier on, uh, almost two million years ago, uh, probably Homo erectus leaves Africa and disperses across Asia and Europe. And over time, they sort of speciate into these other, you know, hominin species. Uh, eventually, Neanderthals are in Europe, Denisovans in Eastern Asia, and possibly another species, maybe even Homo erectus itself, still lingering uh, somewhere else here. And so when Homo sapiens leave, we encounter these other hominin species that were kind of already there. And so we mix with Neanderthals in Europe mixed with Denisovans in Asia. And when I say mix, we encountered them. And basically there's two ways this can turn out. It's either love or war, or maybe even kind of both, but definitively there was interbreeding, uh, intermingling of DNA. Uh, initially it was thought that only people of European descent and to lesser extent Asian extent would have Neanderthal DNA because Neanderthal wasn't in Africa. But because of all of this mixing, genes actually even flow back the other way. And even native African populations that never left Africa, they still have a small amount of Neanderthal DNA. Uh, people with European ancestry have more. So if you ever take like ancestry.com or whatever, it's something on the order of like 2% as average. Europeans have more. Uh, and then as we get over here, there's more of that Denisovan DNA influence, uh, and particularly down in this area. Uh, so just very complex, a lot of intermingling. Again, like it's kind of hard to define what a species is. Are we actually different species if we're able to successfully uh, viably reproduce with each other? Uh, sort of difficult to say, but uh, you know, even the Pacific Islands uh, eventually get populated. So even Easter Island, the most remote place on earth is uh, populated by humans, uh, you know, somewhere around about like 700-ish AD and humans get to the new world. Uh, originally it was thought that the ice had to retreat for that to happen. So we would have had to have waited until about like 14,000-ish years ago, 12,000-ish years ago. But there's starting to be evidence like New Mexico, there was this new human footprints in White Sands, New Mexico that are probably about 23,000 years old. Uh, if that is the actual age, then humans somehow got to North America and eventually South America before the ice even retreated. So maybe they kind of coast hopped down along the flank of the ice, down along kind of the Pacific margin. Uh, so interesting to think about. Uh, obviously, like very early on in our history, uh, life was precarious. Uh, life was hard. Nature is red in tooth and claw. And humans were no exception to that. I mean, we're still part of nature, but we've somehow managed to kind of isolate ourselves to some degree. But we were at the whims of these big natural disasters at some point in human history, there's this genetic bottleneck where we have this genetic diversity before there's this bottleneck where a massive kind of die off, uh, possibly less than 10,000 individuals still remaining on the globe. So humans kind of almost went extinct uh, and some of this genetic diversity was lost. And it's once it's gone, it's gone forever. And it, in the new population that arises on the other side of the bottleneck, uh, we never get those genes back. Uh, some a lot of debate about exactly when and why this bottleneck occurred. One interpretation is that it was Mount Toba in Sumatra, this massive supervolcano eruption uh, on the order of like a Yellowstone supervolcano eruption 
uh, might have done that, but uh, some other ideas like disease or competition, but just it's important to recognize that this genetic bottleneck occurred. Uh, moving along again, as we get, you know, smarter <laughs> or, or at least more complex, uh, we can make fire, we can eat food that's cooked, we can eat, open up different foods, we're getting more nutrition, uh, a little bit easier. Uh, life is not quite as much of a struggle as it was before. And for the first time, we have, you know, downtime, some amount of downtime, we also start maintaining sort of a steadier home base. So there's these, instead of kind of these wandering, roving bands, there are like more steady occupations of different sites with evidence of kind of long-term occupation. Uh, and since we're staying in one place and we have sort of idle time now, we actually start creating, uh, we start creating art uh, for no other purpose than to express ourselves. Uh, it used to be that making something was, you know, utilitarian. You're, ma you're making a tool, you're making something that's going to help you out. Uh, this is purely expressive. So the earliest non-tool sculpture, uh, definitively by 70,000 years, but probably even before that, uh, maybe as long as like 200,000 years ago, some of these like uh, kind of flimsier Venuses uh, that they look like sculptures, but they're not exactly like rising to the degree of like Michelangelo's David or something like that. Uh, but we're able to make things that are not tools for some reason. And it's probably just to express ourselves. Uh, cave art appears again definitively by 40,000 years ago, uh, maybe even farther back than that. So there is some art in Spain that may be like 60,000 years old that would probably be Neanderthal because modern Homo sapiens hadn't arrived there yet, uh, at least in theory. Again, these dates are highly in flux. Uh, initially, very fairly primitive, but you see that you know it develops into forms where we're actually you know, able to recognize the animals that they're representing. Uh, there's a very cool documentary on Netflix uh, from Werner Herzog, uh, the Cave of uh, Cave of Forgotten Dreams, I think it's called. Uh, kind of walks through the uh, the uh, Lascaux caves and the uh, Chauvet caves and shows the art uh, in these caves in France. Uh, these the symbolism allows communication through time. Uh, we essentially become immortal. These things that were drawn on these cave walls to express whatever it is that they were trying to express. Uh, we're still able to read them today. The creators who literally put their hands on this rock and used these pigments to make this, uh, we're still able to see that. We don't necessarily know what they meant, but we're able to see these symbols much later. Uh, and then kind of the last thing that happens here is about 40,000 years ago, uh, maybe as recently as 30,000 years ago, uh, Neanderthal dies out and Homo sapiens are left. Uh, by ourselves. We're the last hominins remaining. So there is a question as to why, uh, as humans kind of move into Asia and Europe, Neanderthals are sort of pushed kind of further and further west. And it looks like kind of Spain and Gibraltar is sort of their last bastion. So, you know, what's happening here? Why did we, quote unquote, win? Well, again, going back to the brain size, Neanderthal had a larger brain case than we did on average. So if we were smarter, it probably wasn't by much. Uh, they were probably actually smarter. Uh, again, it's not necessarily brain size, complexity matters too, but it probably wasn't a huge advantage, if at all. I and mean, if it wasn't, they might have had the advantage. Uh, we weren't stronger, so Neanderthals had developed, uh, evolved in cold climates of Europe. Uh, cold climates tend to produce stockier, stouter animals to reduce their surface area. Neanderthals were more robust more powerful and stronger than we were. So if they were possibly smarter and certainly stronger, how did we win? Well, one idea is we were just kind of more numerous. Uh, there were more of us and we had traveled all through all of Asia, all of Europe, all of the Middle East. Uh, we had all of these different experiences, these diverse experiences mixing with other cultures along the way and picking up experiences and using our newly developed language skills to kind of pass these things down. Uh, and so that was probably our big advantage was our diversity and our knowledge sharing that probably helped us. Uh, we were able to exploit all these different resources and that's one of our biggest problems today is how good we are at exploiting resources. But uh, that diversity, that communication, leveraging uh, all of our shared experience is how we will eventually solve those problems. So. 
uh, why are we here? Where are we headed? Again, it's a long way from footprints in Laetoli 3.7 million years ago to footprints on the moon. Uh, so that's all we got for today. Here's a brief summary of the Cenozoic, and I will see you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>